God, we are so thankful for your word and we're thankful for moments like this. And Lord, we ask that you continue to guide and instruct us as you see fit. And Lord, we open our hearts and our minds to your word in this moment. And Lord, what we know not, would you teach us? And what we have not, would you give us? And ultimately, what we are not, uh, would you make us? In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Wave at me if you are a pet person. Animal lover, come on, wave at me. Yeah, there's a lot of you. I'm gonna put myself on an island with this one. Uh, I'm not a pet lover. I don't really understand people who are. I find myself in conversations with animal lovers talking about their pets and they pull out their phones and they show you pictures and they let you know all these unique attributes of their pet. Like, you know, she's bashful, but she's still feisty and courageous. I'm like, who says that about an animal? And I just am not much of a, a pet person that said, compared to my wife, I appear like an animal enthusiast. And the two of us have just never been there. Kristen has all these allergies, and so uh, most animals affect her. And we've not had pets. When our kids were a little younger, our oldest three were four, six, and eight, uh, we bit the bullet and fell to their pressure, and we got a puppy, a miniature golden doodle. And moments after getting this puppy, uh, we discovered to our surprise, Kristen was pregnant, which is what you get for going home for lunch on a Tuesday. (laughs) And we were not planning to raise an infant and a puppy at the same time. And it became clear we weren't good at the dog thing. The thing that sealed the deal for us was one day we couldn't find the dog and our toddler had placed the puppy in the refrigerator. (laughs) Now, deep breath, everyone. We did all the research. We had her checked out. We made sure no harm was done to the dog, but we did walk away from that experience thinking, this little lady needs a better home. And so a friend of ours was, was a veterinarian and we were able to upgrade her situation and we've been without a puppy since. Till this last June, once more, the kids uh, rallied against us and we folded our hand and we got a puppy. We recently got a miniature Aussie doodle and uh, this is a picture of her. Her name is Jersey. Look at those eyebrows. And you know, we're figuring this thing out. Uh, Anytime I come around, she's pretty timid and just pees on the floor. Uh, But what I love about it is we're surrounded by neighbors who have these really big dogs and Jersey's like eight pounds right now. And she just goes out there and barks at all of them uh, talking trash. I I guess what I'm saying is uh, she's a little bashful, but she's still feisty and courageous. (laughs) And I think she's the cutest dog on the planet. And I say all that because I have that type of experience all the time. I bump into individuals who would look at the things we say or the things we believe and the things we participate in. And in the same way, I would say, I'm not a pet person, but somehow I just became a pet person. I bump into individuals who show up and they say, you know, I'm just not very religious. The whole God thing is not for me. My favorite statement is they say, I believe in science as if the rest of us don't. Science is not an enemy to our faith. It is only a supplement to the greatest creator ever known. And they will make these statements. I'm an atheist. I'm an agnostic. And I love it because you give it some time and suddenly three months pass or six months pass. And then you find that individual in the lobby wearing a WWJD bracelet telling everybody about Jesus. And they're enthusiastic because uh, they're tends to be this common experience that every single one of us has some skepticism. Every single one of us has some doubts and questions. But as we lean in and we open our hearts, we do discover uh, there is something different about this God. And he does have the ability and the willingness to work in and through our lives. And his word is brilliant and it's insightful and it can instruct our lives in very magnificent ways. And I would say for those of you who are gathering with us, if you're not a Christian at any one of our locations, I just got to tell you personally, uh, I'm just so blessed that you would join us this weekend. 
we pray that this is always a church that anyone and everyone can just don the doors of our church and lean into the conversation about Jesus Christ and God's word and just know every single week you show up, uh, we're, we're just gonna teach the Bible to the best of our ability, and that's what you're always gonna get from Northview. We are in a series called Killing Hostility. Every single one of us is trying to figure out how to live out our faith in the world that we live in. There's tension and strife. There's all kinds of unique dynamics and complexities, and the question is, is how do we do it? How do we honor God yet add value to society? How do we engage effectively uh, and uh, advocate for peace and unity while remaining true to our convictions and the truth of God's word. And this is a challenge, yet the good news is, in the book of Ephesians, Paul addresses some very similar matters. Paul is writing a church that is now made up of both Jew and Gentile. This is the first century church where up until this point, the church was only made up of Jewish people. Uh, those who grew up uh, their entire lives familiar with God and his promises and his commands. And it was things of the faith were always accessible to them. And now here come the Gentiles who have been completely foreign and unaware of this faith. And now they're engaging and becoming a part of the family of God. And the question is, is, well, how do you do this well now with a group of people from different backgrounds and experiences and traditions and walks of life? How do you do this well? And Paul uh, seeks to uh, develop some unity in the church of Ephes uh, in Ephesus. And I think uh, we can learn some things as well. Chapter one, Paul starts out in a very encouraging fashion. He starts out and he just says, you and I are blessed in every spiritual way in Christ. That God has been so good to us through what Christ has done and offered through the, the cross and his just faithfulness to lay down his life also that you and I can discover true life. And he comes to this church and he says, hey, you're doing well. You're thriving in your faith. There's some things that you ought to be proud of, some things that I just want to commend you for. Yet there's still more in store. There's still some opportunity for you to grow into the stature that God has desired for you. And anyone thankful that no matter how long you follow Christ, you could be a Christian for 40 years and you're still discovering, oh, there's more. There's still more to this God. You cannot exhaust this God. There's, there's more in store. And Paul comes to them and he says, my prayer for you is that God would give you the spirit of wisdom and of insight and that he would enlighten the eyes of your heart. That's what we looked at last week in chapter one. Essentially, Paul is saying that insight is more valuable than eyesight that it is easy to play Captain Obvious and to stare at things that are on the surface, but wise are those who learn to think more critically and independently. Individuals who look beneath the surface and think of deeper matters. Individuals who stay with an idea long enough to test its validity to determine whether or not they can build their life upon this. And if you don't do so, uh, there's a good chance you will fall for nonsense. And Paul then, in many ways, seems to switch gears without a clutch. Chapter one is very positive. Chapter two feels as if he's going for the jugular. And Paul doesn't mince any words here. And verse one, chapter two, he says, as for you. Now elbow or, or point to your neighbor and say you. Right? He's talking to you, right? As for you. You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, all of us, big statement, all of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, big statement, we were by nature objects of wrath, 
But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. Massive statement. It has to be fundamental to your faith and relationship with Christ. It is by grace that you've been saved. Not your performance, not your resume, not your track record. Only by the grace of God can you and I become children of God. Verse six, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. I love that closing statement, expressed to us, how? In his kindness. Scripture would tell us that it is God's kindness that leads us to what? Repentance. His kindness leads us to repentance. Ultimately, it is his kindness that changes our minds and changes the trajectory of our lives. And I think that is important for you and I to remember as well as pattern our lives after that it will also be our kindness that gets the attention of the world and has the greatest impact. That in the same way God's kindness leads to our repentance and opens our eyes, it is gonna be our kindness that is a remedy to the world's blindness. And I believe that kindness is the junk drawer of Christian virtue. Wave at me if you have a junk drawer. Anyone got a junk drawer at the house? Yeah, we all have these. And there's a little bit of everything in that junk drawer. There's some scissors and Gorilla Glue. There's some duct tape. But there's also your checkbook and your passport and some colored pencils for the kids' homework. There's a little bit of everything in there. And I think the same is true for kindness when it comes to Christian virtue. There's a little bit of patience in there. And there's some grace in there and some wisdom and some self-control in there and and there's love and joy in there. And there's some encouragement in there. And it is our kindness uh, that I think is going to have a tremendous impact in the world that we live in. Folks, I say it often, but we do not have to be abrasive to be persuasive. And it is learning, how do we lean into this? Now, fun fact for the Bible geek in the room, uh, Paul is a long-winded preacher who just packs the punch with every statement that he makes. Most people don't realize this, but when you open up the book of Ephesians, the very first sentence in opening remarks to this letter, Paul makes a 202 word sentence. Anyone struggle with run on sentences? It's like, I just got more to say, comma, comma, comma. And that's a long sentence a 202 word sentence. Well, then he comes to chapter two and what we just read verses one through seven is actually one sentence. 124 words, Paul is packing a punch and he's, he's baking all these things into this idea. And today there are four statements, you know, we can't exhaust them all, but there are four statements that Paul makes that I just wanna put on our radar. Here are some things to consider. And I, I will say that in this season, I, I do feel very pressed uh, as your pastor to uh, continue holding the line and uh, really staying rooted in uh, our belief and confidence in God's word as the source of truth that is infallible and it's inerrant and it is sharper than any double-edged sword. And we bank our life upon this. And I recently was thinking about the movie Footloose. Come on, wave at me if you love the movie Footloose. Yeah, this is the classic. And Kevin Bacon moves from Chicago out to this rural Midwest town to find out that dancing is illegal. And he kind of has this little uh, crush going on with the preacher in town's daughter and all these kids want to dance. And they're like, we just want to dance. And the pastor is getting up in the pulpit every week and he's like, no, you can't dance, right? And it's this weird thing. And in the end, the pastor changes his stance and, and they all get to dance. And I, I feel like the pastor in Footloose. I, I would say where the, uh, the 
illustration breaks down is in the end of this story, I'm not going to change my stance. <laughs> God's word is uh, God's word. And I, I think that's fantastic. There is that statement where Paul says uh, that Satan is the prince and ruler of the kingdom of the air. It's a great statement, the kingdom of the air. Now, there's two main thoughts regarding this. And the first would be that the kingdom of the air refers to Satan's limited authority over the demonic, that we believe in angels and demons, and these demons are defeated foe, and they follow an even bigger loser. And that is Satan's influence. And, and that's something to consider. Uh, the other thought that's also very popular is the kingdom of the air refers to the mediums of the day. Now track with me on this. The idea would be something along the lines of wickedness and evil and Satan's agenda is constantly being transmitted through the different mediums of the air to get his ideas, lies, philosophy uh, across to humanity embedded in their hearts and minds. And when you think of it in those terms, I mean, you can't help but call a lot of things to mind. Like, oh, I can see a lot of things that would fall into the category of mediums within our day in which uh, the lies and the agenda of the enemy are being transmitted throughout culture and society, embedding themselves in our hearts and our minds. And I think those are two things to, uh, I don't know, wrestle with, study, but I would say at a minimum, what we should do in reading this is to at least consider and do an audit of the things that we are allowing to shape our mind and our heart. What are the things that you give access to? What are the things that you give authority to in your life? Because folks, it's, it's simple that uh, ultimately you could look at it as basic economics. It's deposits and withdrawals, deposits and withdrawals. Another way of saying it is your input determines your output. And so if all you're doing is digesting nonsense and lies, well, what is gonna be produced through your life? Bizarre living. And I think many Christians, and this is no judgment, it just is a courageous invitation, but many would be embarrassed to consider how much time, how much space, what percentage am I engaging with God's word and things that edify my faith and shape my understanding of truth and support my convictions? And how much time am I just op living openly to every other thing uh, that is a medium transmitting information into my life? And I think it is something that we need to uh, just keep in mind and honestly assess. The next statement, and probably the statement that jumps off the page for most people, is it says that all of us, like the rest of them, Paul is saying to the Jews, referring to the Gentiles, we are all by nature objects of wrath. And this is something that gets poorly taught. This is something that gets misunderstood. And this is not your fault. If anything, it would be individuals like myself who are responsible for teaching the Bible that a lot of times we misrepresent the wrath of God conversation. And I think the challenge is, is when we read the Bible, you, you read of things like God's wrath, and then you read of things like his mercy and his grace. You see God's um, behavior in the Old Testament, and then you see Christ in the New Testament, and the critic will say, well, there seems to be a bit of a contradiction here. Maybe you've wrestled with that. Have you ever looked at God's grace and God's wrath and thought, which one is it? It doesn't seem like it can be both. And, and here is the beauty of the gospel, that ultimately there are three words that the gospel hangs upon. And this separates Christianity from any other major world religion. Do your own homework. There is no other leading thought community of religion around the world that can make the claims or offer what Christianity offers. And those three words are justice, mercy, and grace. Justice, mercy, and grace. Now, here's the working definition. 
Justice means God giving us what we deserve. That's justice. God giving you and I as fractured sinful individuals who have in many ways rebelled against him, God giving us what we deserve. And this is the thing that makes us all uncomfortable because every single one of us is aware of our shortcomings. Every single one of us is aware of that scripture that says for the wages of sin is death. This stuff makes us uncomfortable. If God's gonna give us what we deserve, well, my goodness, run for shelter. And then there's mercy. And mercy means God not giving us what we deserve. And here comes the question, well, which one is it? Is it God giving us what we deserve or God not giving us what we deserve? Now stay with me because then grace is God giving us what we do not deserve. So what that means is when you understand what Paul is saying here, all of this is not a contradiction, but somehow brilliantly fulfilled in Christ. So Paul's favorite statement in the epistles, he says over 80 times he makes the statement in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. And somehow justice, mercy, and grace are all fulfilled in Christ. Well, how is that possible? Well, Christ marches to the cross and in some brilliant fashion on the cross, God punishes sin, yet preserves the sinner. This is amazing that Jesus is the ultimate sponge. Scripture would call him our shield, that all the corruption, all the sin, all the shame and all of God's wrath simultaneously came crashing down on Christ. It's the ultimate kill shot. There's no greater devastating blow than that which Christ received on the cross. The corruption of religion and government crashes down upon him. And on the cross, Jesus carries and Jesus experiences every ounce of humanity's sin and shame. Now think of how sin and shame has tormented your life. Think about the time you've made a mistake and you've lost sleep over it. Think about that one thing that you're like, man, just this one thing creates so much turmoil in my soul. And Jesus on the cross experienced every feeling, thought, and sensation with the shame and sin of this world. And then to top it off, he was then separated from God the Father. When she cries out on the cross, my God, my God, my Father, my Father, why have you forsaken me? And it all comes crashing down that he experiences the full wrath of God. And in many ways, God the Father, uh, God being all powerful and you cannot uh, put a limitation on his strength, uh, throws the ultimate haymaker and God the Son takes it on the jaw for you and I. It's, it's pretty impressive. Simultaneously, not only does Christ uh, receive the full justice, he then offers us extreme mercy. He takes what we deserve and then he does not give us what we deserve. This is where the theologians would refer to Christ as the great substitute, which I don't know about you, but I always loved those days in school where we had a substitute teacher. I'm like, this is gonna be a great day. This is a gym teacher trying to teach algebra. This is gonna be a cakewalk. It's always better with a substitute. And folks, I'm telling you, when you understand that Jesus Christ stood in your place, he took your position as sinner also that you could take his position as child. It's really remarkable. And the grace idea is fairly simple. Folks, if all Jesus did for us was die for our sins so that you and I could have forgiveness and eternity in heaven, you and I are blessed beyond measure. We are spoiled rotten because of what Christ did on the cross. The fact that he chooses to do exceedingly and abundantly more 
The fact that he still provides peace and he still provides joy. The fact that he's still the great physician in the business of doing miracles and healing people. The fact that he still cares about broken, fractured relationships. That he still desires to guide us, to provide for us and to protect us. That's grace. It is God now giving us what we don't deserve. Above and beyond, cup runneth over his goodness on display in our life. And you have to understand that all those things come together in Christ. And that is how you you reconcile the paradox of, of justice and mercy. But I do think we misunderstand God's wrath. Leon Morris uh, said it this way, and I don't think I could say it any better. He said, the wrath of God is often confused with that irrational passion we so frequently find in man and which was commonly ascribed to the heathen deities. But thank God, that is not what the Bible means. God's opposition to all that is contrary to his nature is not thunderbolts from heaven, but letting us have it our own way. What what he's saying is most of us have a caricature of God. And it's been informed by heathen deities where for some reason, when we think of God, we see Zeus holding on to lightning bolts. And the the thought in our mind is if you cross him, he'll smite you. And that is the picture that most people have of of God. And he's saying, no, that's not the case. He goes on to say it this way. You want to keep crossing the boundaries? You want to go with the flesh of godlessness? You want to cooperate with the forces that oppose my way? You want to live with self at the center? Well, I grant you your wish. This is the wrath of God. Essentially what he's saying is, okay, you want to do life without me? You want to edge me out? You want to exist without me in the scenario? Okay, your wish is my command an eternity without me. That's the wrath of God. It's him saying, I grant you your wish. You can have it your way. And what about that resonates in our soul? The fact that every single one of us knows deep down inside, I hope it doesn't play out according to my way because I recognize and I'm aware of my deficiencies and I pray there's a better way. In fact, that's that's why you're here. You didn't show up to hear me. You are here because you too are hoping there's a better way. And Christ is that better way. C.S. Lewis, he, he said it this way. He said, there are two kinds of people in the world. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says, thy will be done. And maybe one of the most terrifying things is the fact that God will at some point lend us over to our sinfulness. He goes on in verse 11 to say, therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision. Don't have time to unpack all that today. Verse 12 Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. This is an amazing thing that Jesus shows up and from day one, he gets on the inside with outsiders. And there is no one who is too far gone that cannot be hunted down by the hound of heaven in which Christ is constantly in pursuit of every single one of us and pulling us near into relationship with him. And he stands ready to have a personal relationship with every single one of us. He goes on to say, for he himself is our peace who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself. Look at this statement. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, 
thus making peace. And in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. And so much to be said there, but the, the third statement that I think we need to keep in mind is Paul's statement, we both have access. That you and I, though we represent all kinds of different walks of life, stand with an available access to our Heavenly Father. And we believe that every person on this speck of dust in this galaxy known as the earth, every person with breath within their lungs, despite who they are, where they're from, what they've done, and the, the background they come from, every person could be saved and redeemed by our God. That's what we believe, that there's no person that is too far gone and outside the reach of God's uh, grace and love. And we have to understand, like Paul is saying to the Jews and the Gentiles, yeah, you're all very different, but the one thing that you have in common is you both have access. We all have access. Christ dies on the cross, and this is the beautiful scene. You, you gotta go read it yourself this week. It says, as he dies, darkness covers the land. And it says the veil in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. It's a lot of details, but track with me. The temple was uh, constructed in a way with the understanding that no person apart from the high priest could actually enter the presence of, of God, this holy, righteous, powerful, magnificent God that if humanity were to enter his presence, they would die immediately. So in the temple, there was this massive veil that was uh, put together that served as a barrier between the people and the presence of God. And Christ dies on the cross and it says the veil was torn in two from top to bottom as if to say the hands of heaven ripped it, not the hands of earth. And what it declares is now because of what Christ has done, we all have access. The, the barrier, the veil, the thing that stood between people in God's presence has been completely removed. And because of Christ, every broken, every faulty, every imperfect person can come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We have access. Now here's the challenge. Though we all have access, we all take very different journeys into this. And we have to learn to take that into account when we assess where people are at in their relationship and their spiritual journey. Because we all have a little bit of crazy in us. Can I get an amen? amen. I was... Once in high school, uh, I think I talked too much trash in a game of basketball in our PE class. Uh, I think the game of basketball just is better with commentary, and sometimes that got me in trouble. And after one day, we get done with class, I go out into the hallway, and uh, this upperclassman who was a bit of a bully, who was now mad at me from the game of basketball, now wanted to fight me in the hallway. I don't know about you, but I'm a public school kid. Wave at me if you were public school. Yeah. And I didn't go to the roughest high school, but there were times in my high school where fights would break out, whether that was in the parking lot, whether that was in the hallway. People would just, at times, go at it. And on this day, this heavyweight decided he wanted to take me on as his next contender. And I'm terrified. To state the obvious, I'm not tough at all. In fact, never once in my life have I looked at violent things and thought, I'm gonna give that a try. <laughs> I never once looked at mixed martial arts and UFC and thought, I'm gonna get in the octagon. I, I might be good at that. Never once even crossed my radar, not a tough guy. This guy calls me out and all my peers were savage. They all just formed a circle and pushed me into the middle. <laughs> and... I'm standing in this circle. This guy is about to demolish me. And I'm thinking, what are my options? And 
in the last moment, I, I just decided to spaz out. And so I said, okay, before we fight, no rules. And he's looking at me like I'm crazy. All these others are looking at me like I'm crazy. And I said, if we fight, just so you know, I will pinch, I will scratch, I will pull your hair, I will gouge your eyes, and I will bite your ears. I will do whatever it takes. I will kick, I will punch. I, there's no rules here. And this guy looks at me like I'm nuts. He looks at his friends and he's like, this, this guy's crazy. I'm not gonna fight this guy. And he walked away, folks, it worked. It was amazing. So young people, if you're ever in that position, just lose your mind. <laughs> Years later, I'm, I'm with some buddies and we're watching this boxing documentary. And many of you will remember in 1997, Mike Tyson fought Evander Holyfield. And in the fight, Mike Tyson bites off his ear. And my buddy goes, who does that? Who bites someone's ear in a fight? And I thought to myself, I would. I totally would bite somebody. And I say all that because on the surface and in many obvious ways, Mike Tyson and I could not be more different. But then again, in some other ways, him and I have a shared crazy in common. I, I think we do this all the time in the church space. The culture is definitely doing this as well. We obsess over our differences and then we live blind and completely unaware of the fact that uh, we, we do have some things in common. And one of those things is we're all just a little crazy. And it is learning to recognize each person comes from a different background and some people are gonna have a longer journey into this. Maybe you're like me, you grew up in a wholesome home, you, you grew up uh, somewhere in a community where, whether it was in the Midwest, near the Bible Belt, but the community seemed to endorse and support your values and your convictions. You grew up with a frame of reference when it came to faith and church. And so one day you attended a church service and at the end of the service, they led a sinner's prayer. You raised your hand and in that moment, you became a Christian. And you woke up the next day a Christian. And ever since you've been gradually following Christ. For many of us, we were blessed to have that experience. But for others, that's not their journey into it. I get to serve as a, I don't know, a bit of a coach and pastor uh, to missionaries, and I get to help them prepare for the mission field. And I am on this thread of just, you know, conversation between these different missionaries that uh, I have a relationship with. And a lot of times they're sharing different resources and they're asking for feedback. And recently, one of them who is doing ministry in a very hostile part of the world where there's extreme persecution, put on the thread, hey, we're having a baptism service and here is our baptism application for people wanting to be baptized. Do you guys have any feedback? Is there anything you would add? And he puts this form out there and there's seven questions that these people have to say yes to, to go public in their faith. And here are the seven questions. Number one, are you willing to leave home and lose the blessing of your father? Number two, are you willing to lose your job Number three, are you willing to go to the village and those who persecute you, forgive them and share the love of Christ with them? Number four, are you willing to give an offering to the Lord? Number five, are you willing to be beaten rather than deny your faith? Number six, are you willing to go to prison? And number seven, are you willing to die for Jesus? And I wonder if we made those seven questions part of our application process, how would that impact baptism participation? But everyone has a different journey into this. And for some, it's much longer, more complicated. And we have to learn uh, to extend empathy to, for people taking different journeys into the faith. Can I get an amen? It's learning to recognize our value add and the limitations of it. Not a single one of us has everything fully figured out. 
Some of us are good at certain conversations and not at other conversations. Recently, I was driving with Kristen and uh, we were having a conversation. My daughter's now entering high school and uh, she has peers who are now uh, having their first kiss. And don't worry, I don't know names. I don't know if this is teammates, classmates, whoever. So if you're like, who is it? Is it my daughter? You know, I don't know. I don't know who it is. But Chris and I were having this conversation uh, about when are we gonna allow our kids to start dating? What do we feel is appropriate? And Kristen asked me this question. She said, uh, do you remember your first kiss? I was like, absolutely. It was a train wreck. A game of truth and dare, and it was a mess. And I said, do you remember yours? And she said, yes, I was, I was in high school. A guy took me on a date. He walked me to my door and on the doorstep, he kissed me. It was a real proper thing. And I thought about my daughter who was in high school, uh, standing on my doorstep, kissing a boy. And I thought, I'll kill him. I will kill him. I ordered all the new doorbells and cameras and... The problem with me is I'm inconsistent because just in the same week, I'm hanging out with my boys and their buddies and we're, I'm listening to their conversation and one of them mentions a cute girl in their math class and I immediately jump in with some dad humor and I'm like, well, you might as well make it count because it's a math class. And uh, <laughs> I'm just all over the place with the dating conversation. And what we're learning in this season is I probably shouldn't talk to my kids about dating and Kristen probably shouldn't teach them to drive. And we're, we're just, we're, we're learning our, our lanes. And, and I would just say, some of you, you're really good at the marriage conversation, but you're not good at the political conversation. Some of you, you're really good with the parenting conversation, but you're not good with the financial conversation. Some of you, you're, you're great with the sexual conversation, but you're not really good with the reconciliation conversation. And again, it's just all of us learning to walk humbly and say, where do I add value? And where am I overextending myself in the engagement? And how can we as a community of faith learn to lean on each other to where we can be the best version of ourselves? And lastly, Paul ends and he says, his purpose is to make the two men one, referring to Jew and Gentile as one new man is his statement. God is making you new. Paul is coming to a church and he says, okay, Jews, just so you know, it's not gonna look like what you're doing. It's gonna look new and different. Gentiles, just so you know, it's not gonna look like what you're doing. It's gonna look new and different. And anyone thankful that God seeks to do a new thing and to make us new and to redeem our lives, it's, it's an amazing thing. And ultimately, Jesus is uh, the meaning of what it truly looks like to be human. And Jesus rises from the grave, completely establishing a new reality in which there is life beyond the grave. And we can live forever as new creations in Christ. And it makes me think of Michelangelo who uh, famously sculpted the, the statue of David. And there's a story where he finds this massive boulder and he, he brings it to where he's gonna work on it and a group of people gather around him and one individual says, how are you going to make this big rock into David? And Michelangelo said, little by little, gradually over time, I'm just going to remove all the parts that aren't David. And folks, it doesn't matter if you've been a Christian 40 years or whether you're not a Christian at all. Just know that little by little, gradually over time, our faithful father removes the things that are not true to who he designed us to be. And we get to step into the new creation in Christ, amen? amen. And so that's why we, we live with thankfulness and that's why we celebrate the goodness of our God and that's why we live anchored to the cross, amen?